and Ms. Swanson. Roll call. Mr. Bale? Here. Mr. Horton? Here. Mrs. Showerman? Here. Mr. Scatella? Here. Mr. Shank? Here. Mr. Wodarski? Here. And Cheryl McRae? Here. Thank you. We move on to hearing of the public. We have no one signed up today, but if anyone would like to be heard, we have about three minutes to speak this afternoon. I just want to say this morning. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to be heard? Anyone from the public who wishes to be heard? And can anyone, can you see if anyone has their hand? No one has their hand up at this time. No one has. And finally, last call, anyone from the public wishing to be heard today? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of minutes. These are from the previous meetings and we have several uh, that need to be approved. I think we do those as one vote unless any of the board members have any reason to separate them out. All right, I will entertain a motion then for approval of minutes. Second. Okay, we have a motion from uh, Mr. Scatella and second from Mr. Showerman. Any discussion? Mr. Hort? Yes. Mr. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Scatella? Yes. Mr. Shane? Yes. Mr. Wynarski? Yes. Mr. Bale? Yes. And Sherwin Rennie? Yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the election report and the summarization of the 2022 primary election. We're going to start with Tanya Fernandez, election supervisor, and she'll begin our report. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the elections office processed 19,975 vote by mail applications, and we counted 16,499 returned ballots. We also recorded that 38,592 votes were cast at the polls. In total, we have 55,394, or a 31.2% turnout. We had a very successful election day. Although we were faced with staffing shortages in our office, everyone involved did a remarkable, remarkable job at assisting poll workers and voters. The online help desk we now have available for poll workers has proven to be a valuable tool and it frees up our phone lines. As with most primaries, we received several calls from voters that were unable to vote for their candidate of choice because they were not registered with the candidate's party. As always, I investigate the concern and the party affiliation we have on file were accurate. Before next year's primary election, I would like to conduct more voter outreach efforts to educate the public on how to verify their party affiliation and possibly request changes for the deadline and election day. 188 provisional ballots were issued at the polls for various reasons. Upon discovery during, during canvassing, 37 of the ballots were rejected, 15 partially counted, and 136 fully counted. As you're aware, the Acting Secretary of the Commonwealth issued a mandatory recount of votes cast at the May 17th general primary for the Office of the United States Senate. Our office was able to conduct the recount in two days without significant issues. In accordance with the Pennsylvania Election Code, we conduct our 2% hand count audit for the election. The results determined that our voting machines tallied the votes correctly. I've created a, vigor a vigorous reconciliation process to determine the accuracy of our elections. Our team looks at the numbers of voters signed in at each poll and compares it to the number of registered voters in that precinct, along with the number of votes cast at that poll. We also confirm that all provisional ballots are accounted for and that the proper, proper security measures have been recorded. These efforts help us to ensure the integrity of our poll workers and the election. The post-election reconciliation process has verified the accuracy of the primary election results. Uh, preparations for next election. We plan to incorporate an online help desk for voters. The link to the help desk will be posted on our website. I also have some great ideas for the candidates during next year's petition filing period. 
I'll talk to you guys about this later. One election at a time, right? Okay. Thanks, Tanya. Madam Chair, if I can continue. Here we go. I like to have Tanya, she always has the good stuff. And you know, I'm here for the areas of opportunity, so to speak. So, so we, you know, obviously it's been my, my first election was a learning uh, experience nonetheless, but I think, you know, we all owe Tanya everything for the heck of a job she did to lead our team. Um, the, the staff, amazing team we have. I mean, you know, unfortunately our poll coordinator uh, unfortunately took ill and we, you know, she laid the groundwork for us. So everything was set for election day, but everybody stepped up. And I think, you know, we owe everything to our team that did a heck of a job. So first off, I had to mention that. Um, but one thing that I did learn is um, I made a mistake with the constables. Um, I was under the impression we did not need constables in the polls. Um, we haven't had constables actively in the polls since 2019, a few here and there, like we learned on election night. Uh, we have 28 elected constables. Um, I'm working with the uh, constable, um, general order of constables, uh, the state to create a plan of how we can go forward. Uh, we have confirmation from 26 of our 28 elected constables, they can work in the general election. So they will be paid uh, the same, of course, as the majority of our poll workers, uh, the $155 the time. Uh, there are some, such as Mill Creek and the various uh, wards in the city, they're challenged with having numerous locations to cover, so we'll be working on that. But that's something as we get closer to election day. Uh, but I thank the PA Fraternal Order of Constables for bringing this to my attention, that we were not, you know, properly handling our, our constable procedure, so we are correcting that. Um, and Councilman Horton, I want to correct the number of poll workers that we talked about before. Uh, we actually had 781 poll workers, um, and out of those, we had four that were you know, part-time poll workers, you know, covering different shifts. Uh, 894 is our desired number. Uh, as like Tanya said, in a perfect world, and it was something that Sue's focused on as well, is we have six per precinct. Um, some precincts um, need a little less, and some need a little more, but that's what we're working on, you know, ironing out. Uh, we're lucky to have Sue Sheffield as our poll worker coordinator, who's doing a heck of a job right now, going through and getting everything organized. She's reviewing everything from the primary and figuring out you know, right now, where are our polls? Where are our areas of opportunity? Uh, she was happy to come back to a nice stack of folks that signed up as interested to work the polls going forward. Uh, so kudos to our poll workers for recruiting, not only running the polls on election day, but recruiting poll workers. So we're thankful for that. Um, we did have some individual concerns from our poll workers. Uh, some that needed, you know, hey, we need another tablet at our precinct, or hey, we can use pens, or this or that. So we have those, you know, we're taking care of those per precinct. Um, you know, some of the poll workers, too, thought, you know, here's different ways you can, you know, help out training. We have some um, suggestions for you, so we're working through those as well once we get our training process going. Uh, one unfortunate area, which is a major concern for poll workers and our staff, was our stacks of ballots that we received from our printer for teams. Each stack of ballots were supposed to be in a stack of 50, uh, wrapped in cellophane with a label on top. If you remember election night, a couple judges came with all these labels going, this one had 40, this one had 56. So Tanya and Megan and I sat down with Dave Shanowski from Horace Haynes and said, how do we fix this situation? Uh, so they're going to be hand counting and weighing them to assure there are 50 in each pack. Uh, you may ask, why is it a concern? Is that end of night? I was you know, we talk about how judges that they're all stressed out at the end of the night after working a hard day. And when the numbers don't match, when they're saying, okay, we have this many ballots, there's a concern. Our team, I got a chance to really watch what they do post-election. It was slowing us down. Wait, this number's off, that number's off because we didn't know how many ballots they went through. You think I went through three packs? I went through 150. It was actually 112 or 180. It varied. So David's going to correct that going forward by weighing them and counting them. So we know in the general, that stack says 50, it's 50 ballots. Uh, that, and that was the, the main concern. Uh, our custodian is with us here, Jim Chirpak. Uh, he's working on our you know, area of opportunity in Mill Creek, whereas Councilman Scutella had advised us, we have to move three polling places. So that's Mill Creek 13, Tracy School, Mill Creek 18, J.S. Wilson, and Mill Creek 22, McDowell Intermediate High School. So Jim's in the process of working on getting those moved or possibly combined with other polling places. And obviously they'll be through at a further meeting once we have everything locked in to move to those precincts. And that, that's really all that I have. I uh, wanted to see if there's any questions, you know, any of you have for us, uh, but that's pretty much what I have in my, the end of my report. Questions? 
know for you. Why do you have to go to those? I'm just curious. Because of the going there, they have to adjust the calendar because you can't have to get kids in school.
but uh, getting into video surveillance of the workers inside the office. That was, if it's one pressure the workers, they know that they're taking the videos of the camera. And uh, the second thing is the potential um, access to the Certainly, if everything that we do, the, everything the election board does is going to happen. If there were three things that people wanted to see from the election of the previous election, from the election board previous election, if there's 10 things, now there are 10. And the more the election board does to try to make itself transparent, it has to also be sure that there's an open, open box of the gates to all of them having to comply with. 10 more things and 15 more things, et cetera, et cetera, and see what you can on. So I think that the, the, the board should consider one, whether they even want cameras in the election office. And two, if they do, how to set them up so that, uh, you know, it's, it's not accessible to the public. I didn't clarify, though. Oh, sorry. I was going to clarify the cameras. The, the cameras are not based on a, on a workers per se. There will be a camera based on the, the, the cage where we hold all the ballots. Right now, there's no camera on that cage at all. So it's focused there. Will it get workers on there? Absolutely, but it's focused on the cage. Then a camera focused on the fish tank, you know, the, the results room, so to speak. There's no camera on that results room, and it wouldn't hurt to have an extra set of eyes, you know, there in that room, of which primarily is Tanya, whoever else she assigns to be with her in that room. We currently have uh, one camera in that office right now, and we did move it just before the primary to focus on the drop box in the office because my concern was actually was thanks to Randall and our team brought it up that you know an arm could just come in and drop off a ballot, and that wasn't good with me. I wanted to make sure we had a face there so we could tell who was you know coming in and dropping off the ballot as there had been concern. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to have COVID. All I see is a series of writes of requests. It doesn't matter what you see a lot of you see a whole person or someone that has someone met across the room. I think you have opened up for more. I think it does more harm. I think we, with the United States, uh, make a safe decision to assure that this is bad. I want transparency that we do. And the one thing that no one can argue with, uh, is that especially with all the money that we spent on the new system, I mean, there's very little room for uh, on the paper plate one or paper trail, you have a paper trail. You start talking about that mailbox out there. It's, well, did, you, did you drop in two? Or one, did you have the proper paperwork to drop in at two or one? Uh, oh, I want to see this. I can see a series of rights of those things you all like nobody's business. Uh, of course, if you've got time to make so many things. Uh, yeah, Two in the general, I'm sorry, the primary when I was here, that's where we were, hold, that was our holding tank. 
for any ballots that were not sorted in terms of you know scanning yet or further zip codes. So we put them in the fishbowl. So that's why we want that camera there to assure that there was no, I mean, like you said, I want the ballots you know, that are in the offices to have the camera on it. Well, technically it would in that room. 2024 will be a different story. I'm worried about 2022 in the general election. So that would be the purpose there. But that was our storage tank. So in case we didn't get a chance to um, you know, time stamp them or place them in their appropriate precinct, we left them in that office. And this way there's a, there's a camera there as well. Of course, there's the window that you can see through, you know, walking by, but the camera would also be helpful from that perspective. Tom, I have a question. <clears throat> question. Um, as far as, as we know, security cameras, ubiquitous, is that the word? Um, they're present everywhere. Now, when you get into the courthouse, we've got a lot of security camera footage for hallways and as far as who's going walking through hallways, not as much in the offices themselves. And um, I went through this, I guess, a little bit, and not even just in the courthouse, in other buildings on my behalf. I went through this when I uh, was with the library. Uh, there were occasionally requests to see film footage. And um, we were pretty restricted, as I recall, as far as what we could look into as far as investigating that it needed to be part of a, some type of a complaint um, that had gone to, you know, a, a judge had approved uh, the release of the video footage and so forth. With, with such, what type of um, restrictions, I guess, would be governing those? Because it's my understanding, too, that the Department of State doesn't require video surveillance on your right to know requests, we have that in So I guess- The ballot itself, and you know, yeah. specifics. What, yeah. what type of, uh, what type of restrictions to your knowledge would cover the First, with regard to the decision that you're referring to, about the specific comments that have to uh, provide video surveillance, that is not the law. That is uh, an agency decision. That is on appeal from the courts and has yet to be decided. And that's been a wonderful case. It's all on the facts. So that is not the law. Uh, I don't know whether I, I could tell you, I could tell you this if you don't have any video surveillance, you don't have to turn it in. But if you do have video surveillance, sooner or later, you're going to have to turn it over, provided that the argument is made, goes to the court on a plea. And it's available under the right to know law. In another sense, uh, if the plaintiff thinks that there is uh, fraud being involved, in this this law has been on the books forever. Election law. So if anybody that wants to allege that they think there's fraud without even proving it is allowed to file a petition with the court on the police. None of them have to try to prove it. They would want access to any video and they would be granted access to that video. Uh, we have seen since the last, since the 20 election, uh, all of the complaints made by people and, and the increase in right to know requests. And right now there is one uh, group that has flooded uh, the election uh, boards throughout most every county throughout the Commonwealth with requests to provide all of the 2020 data, all of it. And I don't know where that's gonna end up, but um, I'm more concerned that, um, that workers, human beings' privacy isn't uh, interfered with and that they don't have to go to work uh, while there's cameras on them to see whether they uh, did something wrong it makes you feel like you're not trusted. Now, in all fairness to Julie, she's never seen prior elections. I've seen 30 of them. I just tweeted. Um, this office, regardless of what's happened nationally, has always acted above board, and all of the workers have always done well. And they should never, just because the trend nationally has been to challenge the integrity of the voting process. That shouldn't make us believe that there's a problem when there isn't. And the idea of uh, 
monitoring uh, the election office simply because that's the trend as opposed to what the trust is doing right now. It's just not, it's just not a very good idea. Um, well, obviously, we'll be taking this to a vote. Uh, Andre, would you, would you have one more yes. say on this? Yes, sir. Uh, recent history has shows why the person of Canada is concerned because all you do is one coup of one citizen, just like the same thing. One of our individual employees did something that the is not from the revolution. In the most recent case, these people had. But it was filmed. Very well documented. The lady had met to her daughter, Marcy's family. Then we found her name and information. People went up in her house to make citizen arrests. See if I believe her or not. We all know what the climate is on now. We act like it's normal, but we want to. So I just cautioned along with also uh, I know the police body came we went to the wrong thing with that. Who has the right? What do you have to do? Do you have to have do you have to uh, just it, it was not right to go for us? That's just my comment. Yeah, that's uh, I think I know which was the thing that you are talking about. Um, but I think that the integrity of our office is unmatched in it's one state level. And what that means are the things that I have to justify because I need justify the consent of so for point of view. No, this is a different grant. Well, technically 23, but it has to be in that period, you know. Right. But I uh, I don't really see the need for the scanning office and the scanning thing for going into the different there's probably a book that's on the call and we have all of our different documents. So that's the thing. We've always known we want to see each other for the public, but we don't want to see each other for the children. I think, uh, you know, I, I'd like to move on to the next item, but just to, in closing, um, I want to make there's a difference between the cameras that are monitoring activities and conduct. There's a difference between the cameras that are monitoring conduct and those that are monitoring specific entrances to secure areas. And I would suggest that both of these are secure areas and you're monitoring, monitoring the entering and exiting from those areas rather than conduct behavior by the duties of the person working in the area. It really is a true security camera. And we do have people who have quite a bit of activity in those offices, especially during election processes. So I'll be voting for you and I think it's just about a measure of security. Again, this is not the same as um, monitoring uh, productive behaviors or anything like that. But I think it's just kind of like a vote. So Madam Chair, I'm sorry, could Tanya speak on that? I mean, as, as someone who's been around, I mean, I know Tanya's been here for quite a history, but she's been here since 2020. She's been actively seeing these elections, how they've changed. Could, could Tanya comment on this? Sure, but then let's let's wrap it up so we can stay on okay. schedule today. Um, I'm all about transparency. I'm all about transparency, especially in today's climate. Um, but I've also seen the news coverage of the, the ladies that Andre was speaking of in Georgia, and it is a scary scenario. You know, it's something as simple as passing a bank could be mis misconstituted or, you know, misunderstood. Uh, there's a whole 
whole lot that goes in, that we do in elections that the general public doesn't understand and that has recently turned into these giant conspiracy theories. Uh, so I'm all about transparency and having our ballots secure, uh, but when it comes to filming our workers, I do think that we can be opening up something you know, greater than we want to. Uh, but as far as security and having video footage on our ballots, yes, because I mean, I, I want to be able to say for sure, with certain and have proof that nothing was tampered with. <clears throat> the reason why we're really looking at this, this is the scenario that you brought to my attention when we were doing visual, where we had a uh, what's the word, destructible poll watcher back here, yeah. and that could have escalated up very quickly because she's been getting very, very aggressive. Um, you know, she, tell them the story because I wasn't standing there. I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, so um, a poll watcher felt that she was entitled to come into the fishbowl when election night was right, right in the middle of getting the memory cards from the poll workers and transporting them into the fishbowl. So we had uh, we had several cards out that hadn't been scanned yet. It's a little bit scanned each card, and she just walked right in. I asked her to leave. She started arguing with me. She thought she had the right to be there, which she clearly did not. And then she blocked the entrance where I couldn't get out. It turned into like a loud um, confrontation. It was a little bit of a scary issue. Um, so you know, having cameras in that instance. Would it help? I, it more so would help to have someone standing there. I think, you know, I mean, the cameras can prove what she was doing, but having additional security, I think it's also something about that. And that's why I wanted to tell the story from your perspective, because I only got it after the fact. And that's why this year we talked to the sheriff about making laps through there for that same scenario. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Sandy example. That was on video. Who do you think would care best? The election board or the person who simply wanted to get some get some information from your opponents? Well, let's put it this way. We have a person who was aggressive who we decided to make charges against. Video footage would be valuable. Also be valuable to everybody out there uh, that has a right to be We've seen the all you have to do is decide to be You could look at a video. You don't have to look at the video the way you should be looking at it. You can look at a video the way you want to look at it. That's how we are. That's the thing. So the, that's a good example. First, it's a rare example. That doesn't happen. There's no reason to start to surveil everybody because some person got excited. Putting things on camera, we all have different views. It's not going to change anybody's idea. They can turn up the camera the way they want to. They're just the way they want to. It's consistent with their own philosophy. Thank you. I, I understand. We'll, we'll bring it to a vote. I, I think what you said about a room full of money, I think about stacks of money, I think you look at it in a different way. But I think that's the way I think we should be. Those ballots have ballot, and I think that there should be camera on the ballots themselves. So let's move on, and we'll, we'll continue to see an up or down vote on that. But we'll do the voting at the end. Um, could we have a report on that? Uh, Act 88, of course, is the funding for the election integrity grant program that was approved by the General Assembly and, of course, by Governor Wolf. Um, Tanya, Megan, Amy, and myself uh, attended the webinar to get more familiar on this and the overall process. Um, as you see, as we could go further down through it, uh, we are allotted approximately $5.15 per registered voter. Uh, the number they have for Erie County at the present moment is 177,049 voters, which would lead to $911,743. And this is what I was mentioning, sorry, Chairman, or, uh, sorry, Councilman uh, Showerman, is again, this is the one that's set um, on basically the fiscal calendar, so to speak. So this type of funding, if we were to move forward with it, we would receive it 
Um, you have to apply between August 1st and the 15th annually, receive it on September 1st annually, and then of course the reporting system there. Um, as we know, there are those nine areas that we would need to focus on for the funding, and we're familiar with those, payment of staff, physical security, post-election procedures, uh, maintenance activities, the overall printing of ballots, the cost of election officials, payment of our poll workers, uh, the preparation of storage and management, um, the, the cost of different duties related to the applications. Um, and as we know, we, our last election, the primary, cost us $372,973.05. Um, yes, that did include the $40,000 reprint uh, of our ballots. Um, but just looking at you know, where we could use this funding, of course, um, election workers, you know, we did have, it was cost us $131,390 uh, in this past primary. Uh, those are just for the workers there in the polls. Um, overtime in our registration office, $5,727. Um, the overall printing uh, of the ballots, you know, $35,000, dollars whatever the price tag is, that, of course, is all included. Um, and, of course, um, if we do move forward with this, we do have the ballot extractors to discuss as well uh, on this agenda, which, of course, funds can be used for that to help not only increase the integrity, but the efficiency of the ballot counting process. Any questions? Um, seeing that, you know, I would like to make just a comment about this. This was uh, one of those things that uh, when it came up, I, just, I think I saw the potential for some controversy with it, and um, I had I had some doubts about it initially. But I, I look at this and I know that I see a situation. Um, yeah, I think there's too much suspicion where there's a lot of modesty, a lot of care, a lot of integrity. Uh, but by the same token, this um, gives counties a chance to have technology behind the county, behind everything that they do, and um, it, it puts government money, I guess, uh, where it's really needed. And uh, so again, I, you know, I think it's a beautiful situation. I think it would provide great help to this office. And, and um, you know, I think just the fact that we'd be able to get everything done at a much, much quicker pace than we can presently. And I think we do a pretty wonderful job now. But in, in terms of getting it done more efficiently and more effectively, I think this does offer that. So thank you very much. And if we could, yes, I just want to say that as over these things, I don't see any issue with accepting the money. My biggest concern is just the back end reporting. It's very specific when it comes to poll workers or see Tanya's time or Julie's time spent on a specific election. There has to be specific reports of hours and how you're determining if they're paid. That would be my only concern. It's just that there'd be, which I'm sure they're fully capable of doing. That was just the only thing that I noticed that if the reporting isn't correct, they could say, okay, you have to put the money back. So we just need to be diligent on that. And I think that's you know, well said. Do you see any issue with that? Yeah, I think that's fairly easy. I also looked into the reporting issue. It's like, I will be able to handle that pretty easily. I think everything else is pretty straightforward. Like, if you're buying ballots, you know it's for the election, but just with that time track. Thanks. If I could jump in quickly, they use the DCD system, of which I'm very familiar with and have used um, you know, in terms of the grant application process and the, you know, basically the follow-up you know, paperwork process. It's a very simple process. It's all online, very easy to use, very self-explanatory in terms of filling out every you know, single cell. I've been in direct communication with Ted Martin, uh, who runs the local center for government services for DCD, and they're happy to assist with any you know, additional questions we have or if issues come up, what have you. But I have faith in the DCD system and you know, in terms of using it. But you know, thank you for mentioning that, Amy. It, it could be a concern, but I, I have faith in our in our office to make sure we have everything correct. I think mean, it's just two good points out that we need to be diligent. So I appreciate that. All right. Uh, next item. Uh, no one has any other questions. The poll workers payment. Yes, Jill Pensy, our administrator. Uh, this has been a project of hers, so we're going to let Jill take the lead on this one. Hello, everyone. 
everyone. I just wanted to speak briefly about the payment of the poll workers. I'm Zoom. I hope we have Stuart Long from Port Funds. Jill, I'm here. If you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. But as you know, we currently pay poll workers in cash. What you might not realize is that on election night, we have over $150,000 in our revenue office. What we would like to do is streamline the payment of the poll workers through electronic funds. At training, the poll workers would basically get a pamphlet, just like this one, which would include a debit card or just a card like a MasterCard. Then on election night, we, the election office, would upload a payment file to court funds. Court funds would then disperse payment to the poll worker electronically. That would eliminate the need for overtime in the revenue office and also overtime for the deputy sheriff that is assigned to the revenue office on election night. The cost of the disbursement is 55 cents per disbursement. This is also the same system that the courts use to pay Erie County jurors, which I recently served as a juror and was paid via court funds. And as a user, it was pretty slick. It was very easy. Um, that's really basically all I have. Stuart, if you would like to say a few words or maybe answer any questions that any of the board members may have. Sure, I would love to. And I want to thank you, Jill, for all your due diligence and time you've spent evaluating this technology. And, and board, I'm pleased to introduce myself. I'm Stuart Long. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for a company called Rapid Financial Solutions. Uh, we have different uh, products. Uh, the one we're talking about today is Court Funds. Uh, a little bit about us. We were founded in 2005, um, and we specialize in working with government uh, agencies all across the different sectors in terms of helping them disperse monies that is owed out to recipients through our electronic funds platform. We are sponsored uh, by FDIC insurance, which means that all the money that goes into our system and out of our system are insured. Uh, we are regulated and audited uh, by the FDIC insurance agency, so we are certainly audited. We also handle all of the account holders issues or questions, and being that we are regulated by the FDIC, we are monitored for the quality of the responses and the timeliness of those responses. Uh, today, uh, for example, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we currently are serving uh, over 53 different agencies uh, throughout the Commonwealth. So we, we're very well known throughout the Commonwealth. And I would just you know, ask if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take any questions. Board members? I apologize. Oh, I'm just checking for comments. Uh, Mr. Horton. Oh. Sure. Thank, thank you, sir, for um, sharing your time and talent. Uh, achievement of benefits. I know it only costs the county 55 cents, but what happens if one of our poll workers loses their car or, they ch or, or does it just pay them one payment or is it something that, uh, that they use multiple times and is there a fee charged to them? Using the card. Great question. There are no fees to the cardholders to use the card. Being that we are an FDIC insured bank and we are you're traditionally just like your bank, um, in that disbursement jacket that the juror would receive, it will have all of the frequently asked questions um, labeled in there. Also, our customer service number. In the case you referenced, uh, they would contact us, let us know that they've lost their card, and we would then immediately freeze their account. Hello? We would freeze their account, and then we would, we would manage that individual as to how best they would like to receive um, their monies. One other thing that our service does provide is if someone did not want to use the card, um, they could obviously deposit that card in their in their bank. Um, they could do a remote deposit like we do. Uh, they could request those funds be transferred to their PayPal account. 
um, and so on. So we do provide the cardholder with multiple different options to receive their monies, and there's no cost to them to receive their money. As a matter of fact, if someone decided they just wanted a paper check, they would contact court funds. We would close their account and mail them a paper check at no additional cost. Thank you. Thank you yes, sir. Yeah. Got a quick question for you. This is Brian. I'm just sitting here looking at your brochure. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. So a balanced inquiry is 99 cents. So if somebody wants to check their card, it's, it's a buck a shot. Is that what you're saying? No, great question. If they want to go to an ATM machine, if they wanted to go to an ATM machine and check their balance at an ATM machine, then yes, that is a 99 cent charge to check their balance. Within that document, there's instructions that they can check their balance online. They can check their balance by calling an 800 number, or what they could also do is download our mobile banking app. And on our mobile banking app, we'll have their balance, their transactional history, and all the things you look at when you dial into your bank account. So that only fee would only come into play if they check their balance at an ATM machine. Okay. Yeah, this is a really thick pamphlet that would take a long time to get through that. So that just kind of popped out. Are there any other big yeah. fees we should be aware of? Look at the bottom one. Three activity. Yeah, are there any other? That's kind of the gist of where I was going. Is this going to cost them? Where is this going to cost our poll workers, if anything? Are there any other fees, possible charges that we should be aware of? Right. So the inactivity fee is after a certain period of time, if they have not used the card or received all their money off of that account, due to the banking rules and regulations of unclaimed funds, we charge an inactivity fee of $3.95 for 30 days to take that account to zero. Just like today, if an individual that gets a check um, loses the check, after a couple of years, they realized they lost the check or they didn't cash the check. They would call uh, the individual that wrote the check back and say, hey, I never cashed that check. And what would happen is the individual that wrote the check would rewrite a check and remail it out. So within that document, if you'll see that it, and during the education process on the poll workers, we explained we would be explaining that to them that if they realize that they did inquire an inactivity fee after the period of days, then they could call us and should call us and we'll put 100% of their money back on their card. If there are any unclaimed funds, then we have to follow the rules and regulations of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and turn those monies back over to the Commonwealth. Any other questions? So today, if someone, if a poll worker didn't cash the check or their whatever, they would, you know, follow that pretty much the same process we just laid out. Any further questions, clarifications? One more, thank you. I, I don't have any questions for you, uh, no. I just wanted to say something that, that inactivity doesn't start for 100 days. Um, that's a good one. Right. But I was just going to make a statement from, from being the judge of the elections for 20 years or more. I, I welcome this. I think it's a tremendous advancement. And I will leave the courthouse often close to, close to $1,000 cash at night. And by the time we leave here, sometimes we can bring it to a level of money, depending on protection. I've had people follow me, and a couple of times I felt lucky if I got to my car in time. Uh, I was really very lucky. And it, it takes care of all the hassle of the judge this one person before or after. They do it, and it's also one of the slowest processes when you get back to the program. Uh, usually, that's the longest period of time we have to is waiting for the case. So, this is great. If I could just say one more thing on that same note, is once the funds are uploaded to the card, 
court fund notifies the poll workers immediately that those funds are there, either um, by email or text message. All right, there are no other questions then. Thank you very much for that information, everyone. And uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is the ballot extractor before we go through the voting process for these. And I want to apologize. Ballot extractors makes me think of canvassers, pre canvassers, and makes me think of our deputy, uh, Megan Moore, who oversees that area. And I, I left out Megan as part of my report. So, whatever you want me to do, Madam Chairman, if you want me to continue on with this or let Megan jump in, but she wanted to talk about something exciting we've been doing to help with our co worker recruitment. So, do you want me to finish this before she speaks or, or add that as part of our? Um, questions and comments? Can we, uh, yeah, can we have that as part of the questions and comments? I'd like to get through those. For sure. Let's do that. So if we move forward with Act 88, you know, of course, we'll have that, you know, funding to begin to, to use to spend. And Tanya will let her do the, the talking on these ballot extractors. You saw from that video that we sent, she had some great hands-on experience with the ballot extractors. So I'll let her chat about that for a little bit. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'm just going to back up just a little bit. That's most of what I've seen in Act 88, these are things that we already do. You know, the only thing that we don't do is, is uh, start at 7 a.m. and continue until we're done. We usually start at 9 and then we stop around midnight and then start again the next day. So the ballot extractors, I mean, they're just magnificent pieces of equipment. And we've calculated they can open 500 to 700 ballots in an hour and that would it would take a team of eight an hour and a half to open that amount so if we have two ballot extractors we're hopefully going to have the election done by midnight we'll have our results it might take a little longer on presidential uh, but i mean they're just wonderful machines and they're not too big it's a little bit it's a little bit big but they're not too big so i'm going to take up too much space and we'll need two people to work the ballot extractor, one to actually pull the ballot out and then they'll pass it to another person who will open it and lay it flat and then that person will deliver it to the to the glass office where we'll scan it and it. But it's gonna it's gonna decrease the amount of time that it takes to get the two ballots. Thank you. Any questions? So you're gonna put it <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna put it right in the office. We've already looked at space. We have the space for it. We broke out the. <laughs> we have the space for it. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So I don't want to get this honey. We need to move this over here. Call. Okay, no, we're gonna move this over here. Oh, we're probably gonna do some moving. <laughs> right. right. But we're gonna right make enough. it work. That's my first item. Thank you. Well, yes, I do. Uh, I did talk to the director and I, the question that I had for him is how do they know if the envelope's not filled out correctly? And the machine does know that and it won't open it or take the last just pass this Hi there. Uh, Jim from Raz Auto Body, checking to see if. Um, and the counties, for the people that have them, the uh, counties that I've talked to uh, were very pleased with the machine. So lots of people from other counties were very pleased to have it That's why I just thought I'd pass that on. But when I was reading uh, that, I, that did jump out at me when it said that the votes in the county were back in the election. It made it sound like around the clock 24 hours. So this would definitely help. And also, it has, it has another detector at the end. So to make sure if someone misses the ballot in an envelope, it won't go down into the bin. It will stop right there. And you can't, it won't open up the next ballot until you extract that ballot from the envelope that you missed. So it, it does have some safety features as well. Uh, but we would have a team of maybe one or two people 
looking at the ballots at the declaration to make sure that it was signed and you know if it needed to be challenged and setting it aside before it was open. That was definitely changed. Like, that's what he said that the machine would put them in a different area for people working in the mines to see why the machine set it aside. Okay. I mean, we still probably have someone looking at it beforehand. <laughs> you know, maybe until we right. get until we get to know the machine, <laughs> trust it. <laughs> sure. That's that's what I wondered. Are we do we hand count them before we load? Are we loading stacks of a certain number that we've already pre-counted so that we have a check and balance? So yep. All right. Any other questions on these on this balance record? All right, um, let's take it back then and uh, we'll vote on each of these individually. The election security grant seems to be the only thing that uh, has some type of question with it. So if, if any of the board members would like to amend any part of that, I guess this would be your chance to offer that. I realize this is a formal regular council meeting, but uh, on the election security grant itself. They have a motion. Can I ask one more question? Sure. The cameras themselves, you say they're pointing at the fishbowl and at um, where the ballots the cage, the cage where the ballots are. You know, we we're holding those with those red buckets, like almost towards Tanya's office. So it would be directly at that. Uh, the cubicles where our staff, our clerks are, it's not facing those. There's nothing watching, you know, their every move. They are on camera already, as they are aware, based on their suggestion, with that camera that is at our counter. Uh, but yes, these two, these three cameras, one on the ballot box outside, one on the cage that, you know, contains the ballots, and then one on the fishbowl, which we would use for, you know, the tabulation process, but also our holding tank with those ballots we have yet to sort. We we could customize it if you would prefer. The, the, the plan was to run continuously and, and Brad feels it'll be about based on uh, the amount of cameras we have presently of about 30 day uh, window in terms of the way the recording has to think about 30 days. But we could always customize if you say just during these periods, what have you, we could always do that as well. Did that answer the question? These are, we're told where these have to go. Correct. This is a recommendation, not, not by the state. No, this is a recommendation talking to Brad Hirschman, our director of operations, and um, Wilkins Security as well. We were, we were talking about it, and then Tanya spent the time saying, I think they're best here and here. So we were explaining what happens and kind of asking for their recommendation, but also for Tanya's suggestion of where she wanted them. So we can leave it up to us for the election office. Mm -hmm. Not the state, yeah, they're not telling us where to vote. It's our call. And I, and I know Audrey brought up uh, the point to know. I'm not sure. Some cases, you know, maybe in a lot of cases, it throws a way to know out of the way. It also shows what makes people think because of what goes on in this country now that we're hiding something. Uh, so, as long as we can control what we think is right to go, I, I'm comfortable with it. All right, can I have a motion on the election security grant? Second. Oh, no, oh, I have motion. All right, we have first and second uh, by Mr. Shane, Mr. Dale. Yeah, any other discussion? Otherwise, roll call. Mrs. Showerman. I'm going to go along with that. And as long as we have, if we need to vote on something, we have a change. Yes, Mr. Scatella. Yes. Mr. Shank. Yes. Mr. Wanarski. Yes. Mr. Bale. Yes. Mr. Horton. Yes. And Mrs. Shack. I'm sorry. And Chairman Rennie. Excuse me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion then 
on Act 88. So, <clears throat> Second. Motion by Mr. Sherman, seconded by Mr. Sotella. Any discussion? Mr. Scatella. Yes. Mr. Shank. Yes. Mr. Wynarski. Yes. Mr. Bale. Yes. Mr. Borden. No. Mrs. Sherman. Yes. And Sherman Ray. Yes. Thank you. Uh, move on to the poll worker payment. As outlined to us, and I have a approval. So, motion by Mr. Sharman, second, second by Mr. Shang. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Shang? Yes. Mr. Wynarski? Yes. Mr. Bale? Yes. Mr. Horton? Yes. Mrs. Sharman? Yes. Mr. Scatella? Yes. And Cheryl Wynarski? Yes. All right, and finally, the uh, on the ballot extractor, uh, I have a motion on that. So, second. It's been motion by Mr. Shank, seconded by Mr. Satella. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Wynarski. This is the ballot extractor, Jim. He's back. Mr. Wynarski? Yes. Mr. Bale? Yes. Mr. Orton? Yes. Mrs. Schaumann? Yes. Mr. Spencer? Yes. Yes. We got you, Jeff. You can only vote once. <laughs> 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 That's really good. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I hear you. Okay. Madam Chief? Yes. That vote is closed. Oh, uh, actually, we're, we're still finished. Sorry. Mr. Skitell. Yes. Mr. Shank. Yes. And Sherwin Rennie. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Horton. Yeah, I'd like to uh, submit my vote on the uh, Texas security. I'm still not comfortable with it. I'm going to vote to assign. But I'd like to put my vote on the Texas security. No one. On the election security. On the election security. Understood. Okay. You know, and I will say that once the uh, campus arrive, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to have the board take a second look at that. As far as placement. All right. Thank you. Um, this is, we're already over schedule here, but are there any additional questions and comments? We still have the report part. And you can enlighten us on what you've been sure. focused on. A new project. I'll be quick. <laughs> uh, just as Tanya had brought up during hers, um, we were, we've talked about voter outreach. And just to give you a update on what we've been doing, um, we wanted to get more voter services into the community and to get the community to engage in the election day process more. So what we are doing is going out and um, the voter services we are offering are things like voter registration applications, uh, which are also used for address change, name change, party change. Um, that same application is used for those different things. Mail and ballot applications, education on procedure, law, any questions that citizens might have. And of course, the importance and honor um, that we have being able to vote for our officials. Um, the part of engaging in election day, uh, the election day process is most basically said poll workers. We're trying to get more poll workers so that we have um, an abundance um, in the background that we can uh, take from when we need emergencies. You know, so-and-so can't make it that day. Um, so we're out there asking people to sign up as poll workers. And then also if they say, I, I can't, I have to work, I can't take off. We can still give them an information sheet and say, if you know anyone, give this to them and, and tell them about being a poll worker and have them call us. Um, so far to date, we are going to the library branches is where we started doing this to kind of get our foot wet with going out into the public. Um, we've been to Blasco, Mill Creek, and we are at Edinburgh today. 
Um, and then we will also be at Iroquois and Lincoln. Uh, we're going to the flagship city food hall uh, the rest of the Tuesdays from 11 to 1 through the end of August. Um, so we'll be over there. I've been talking with the YMCA for National Voter Registration Day on September 20th, and we also chose another date, September 7th. Um, but of course, now we're moving into elections as well, where we won't have the time to go. So it'll kind of uh, be on a hiatus until January after the elections to get back out there. And then Tanya will be working with the Erie uh, County Community College and the Committee of 70 to have them do some of that work for us as well to uh, get poll workers and help people with any voter services that they need because that's what it is. It's, we are a service to the community and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thanks, any other questions? Like, do you have anything written up with like time, days, locations that we can, we can pass on to us? Absolutely. So I can email really it to you if that's all right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks for <laughs> Is there any way that you could integrate uh, the selection stuff into the mobile library as their pal? Yeah. They did. Um, Director Pierce did mention the bookmobile, but with the limited time that we have, um, I was working at the branches right now, but that is on the Horizon to get with the bookmobile okay. as well. Yes. Yes, I believe so. All of our information, I believe, is there. Good point. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that um, I, just because I, I know that the mm -hmm. that when the COVID 19 was Yeah. What about first Andre and Tom? But I think I was playing private 
making their way into my house or to any of our workers' homes. Like, that's scary. So I think what I've been thinking ahead of this is that we have to prepare ourselves. Oh, yeah. Anyone who's going to be on camera, even though we're trying not to get people on camera, to fully prepare them for, okay, don't pass anything. Nope. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, more checks in place to make sure that you know, there isn't even the perception of something. Exactly. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's. You know, with my doing something wrong. In our world, I was fine with the camera because I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong. So I in our, in our world, the, me, the minute yeah. you step on the property, you're on camera. I mean, you're, you step on the property, you're here. You're on camera. Right. right. They watch you. This, you're ninety percent of your time on this property is watch. Right. Recorded. Right. Make a motion to no. come out of the section. Move to come out of the section. Are we? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Back in regular session, and I believe we had come down to just questions and comments from the board. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Any other questions and comments? All right. If none, then I will entertain a motion for how far behind? 